Hey everybody, Rodney O'Quinn here with Fog Hat, bass player. Woo! And you're watching for bassplayersonly.com. Hi, and welcome to for bassplayersonly.com. I'm John Liebman, founder and first baseman. You know, a lot of people think they're too old or it's too late for them to learn how to play an instrument. So I created for BassPlayersOnly.com for adults who want to learn to play bass because I believe you're never too old and it's never too late to experience the joy and the pleasure of making music. For BassPlayersOnly.com, let's play bass. This week, my guest is Rodney O'Quinn, a very highly regarded bass player. He spent, I think, about eight and a half years with the Pat Travers Band, which seems to be a have been an enjoyable experience for him. We'll have to talk about that a little bit. Rodney has also performed with the likes of Derek St. Holmes, Mark Farner, who, by the way, when I was 14 years old, I thought he was the coolest guy in the world. <laughs> Ronnie Montrose, who I believe I saw with Edgar Winter in 1975 with... Uh, Chuck Ruff and Rick Derringer and Dan Hartman and, uh, wow, yeah, with ZZ Top and Spooky Tooth. But I digress. Rodney has been with Foghat now for several years. That is his current gig. The band's got a brand new, very cool album called Sonic Mojo, which I've been listening to and enjoying very much. This is his first time on ForBassPlayersOnly.com. Welcome, Rodney. Howdy, howdy. How you doing today? All right. I'm doing great. How are you? I can't complain. Nobody wants to hear that. <laughs> You've been with Foghead for how long now? I actually started playing with them in July of 15. Okay. So yeah, that's when I stepped in uh, and started playing uh, for Craig. Yeah. Uh, and then I basically, I did double duty for 11 months where I bounced between Foghead and Pat Travers. So I was uh, I did a lot of jet setting that year. <laughs> it changed hats a lot, huh? Yeah. Well, you know, Fog Hat is known, in my estimation, as being rather selective about who they bring into the band. They don't hire just anybody. No. Well, you know, I completely had Craig McGregor's blessings. Um. Some of the crew guys, because there for a while when Craig would get a little busy uh, managing his son's band, every now and then he'd be like, oh, we got this important gig, you know, so they would get somebody to fill in. Um, Danny Miranda would play with them a lot, which, you know, he plays with Bloister Cult now. Yeah, I interviewed you him know. about a year or two ago. Yeah. And uh, great guy. I love Danny. Um, and then uh, I, I squirreled myself. <laughs> oh yeah so um a lot of the crew guys would always say you, you should talk to rodney you should talk to rodney well it just so happened uh because every now and then we would do shows together like on festivals but our timing would never make it where we would you know be able to catch up or see each other really yeah. except for passing in a hallway um but uh i happened to play craig's hometown on a weekend he was off and him and his wife came out and uh, we hung out, had a great time, and you know, it was this thing. He goes, "Man, I just love the way you play. I love the way you play." So then he was like, uh, "What time are you leaving town tomorrow?" I said, well, "I'm not leaving until about 11. He goes, "I'll pick you up at seven. He goes, "I'll take you to my house and I'll cook you breakfast." <laughs> and I'm like, "Okay," because I'm like, "Going hell, I'm going to hang out with Craig McGregor. I'm not. I'm not going. No, I need to sleep in, you know." Um, but uh, he came and picked me up, took me to his house. Cooked me breakfast. We sat in his kitchen and talked for hours. Uh, and then finally, he was like kind of feeling around. He goes, uh, if the opportunity was to come up, uh, would you be interested? And I'm like, well, I would hate to see you not in the seat, but you could put my name in the hat. <laughs> so uh, I didn't hear anything for a couple of months. And then management called me and they were going to be at SeaWorld in Orlando for two days. And they were doing like two shows a day. And I was off the road, so it was like, hey, come, you know, hang out with the band, you know, and, you know, everybody else. Of course, backing up after breakfast, Craig instantly calls Roger, and he's like, mini me. That's what Roger always says. Yeah, Craig called me right away, and he's like, mini me, mini me. And uh, and uh, so then I came out to SeaWorld, and then it was like, uh, 
and you pick a song, sit and play. Well, I can, whatever one you want to do. I'd already, because that was me, and Mr. Boy Scout, as soon as like there's a possibility, I do my homework, you know. So yeah. I went there. So the first show, the first day, I just came out and just played one song. And then it was like, uh, before the next show, Roger's like, well, we'll play that one. And what other one would you want to play? I no, let's just play two different ones. So across the two days, I played, you know, seven songs just walking out with them out of the set. And at that point, that kind of, you know, between hanging out with everybody and then that, it kind of helped solidify everything. So it, it was a good feeling uh, on all, all the way around. Everybody just felt comfortable and it worked. Yeah, that part of it is important, too. You know, yeah. a, lot, a lot of people don't realize that Fog Hat is actually kind of an outgrowth of Savoy Brown. That Absolutely. Old- this blues band i used to listen to them when i was a kid they had a song called train to nowhere that yes I yeah yeah savoy brown fantastic fantastic band uh tim simmons you know what a legend oh yeah. you know he actually he actually wrote some of the songs on sonic mojo I know that yeah yeah and uh and the, the sad part was is he was supposed to come record some guitar tracks with us but you know unfortunately you know health issues had other plans and he never made it to that but uh we hope we do it justice every time we play it and uh i know uh, a lot of other blues influences on that record some of the songs are written by people like willie dixon and bb king and yeah well i mean uh if there if if it wasn't for blues like we always say if it wasn't for willie dixon there wouldn't be no rock and roll (laughs) you know and uh he was such a uh unsung hero in the blues you know he was a uh, you know up there chess records you know he was a studio guy but he wrote a lot of songs and that was always that was always his thing because uh when fog hat uh originally recorded i just want to make love to you on the first record you know and uh they were adamant uh, lonesome day was like a blues and aficionado aficionado you know so he just and that was his thing they made sure hey we got to find this willie dixon so he can get paid so that was Willie Dixon's thing. Eventually, he's like, I don't know who this fog hat is. He goes, I sure do love the money. <laughs> Funny. I met his grandson one time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there was a point where uh, uh, some of the kids or something came out a long time ago, and they came and saw the band. And then I guess the next night, I think I think the story was that Willie did come out and see the band. Well, this was after Willie was gone. This was at a bass player live, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago. Oh, so okay. Yeah. Came up and introduced himself as Willie Dixon's grandson. I think his name was Willie Dixon the third or something like that. All right. There you go. <laughs> so tell me more about Sonic Mojo. How did it come about? How did the songs get chosen or the recording process? Jump in anywhere. You know, this one, the recording process was a little different than I... I would normally have liked it to be, but we were up against a clock with Roger Hasman had so, uh, shoulder surgery. Uh, he toughed it out to finish the year of touring, but, you know, but it was like, okay, but then it was like, you know, hey, we need to record. So it's like, okay, so we would kick things around and it was like all about trying to get his drum tracks first because we had, we had a deadline that, hey, whatever's going to get done it's got to be done by this date with him. Otherwise, it ain't making it on a record. So everything was kind of laid down as uh, drums and scratch guitar first. And then we had to come back in and sprinkle everyone else's parts in. So um, there was some of it that was like I would show up, okay, you know, come over and cut bass tracks. All right, what are we doing today? And we would listen to it. And then, uh, I'll never forget, uh, like Mean Woman Blues. We did redid that, but we did it. It's almost kind of got a Latin feel to it. Well, when they first started playing the scratch guitar and drums, I'm listening to it. I'm like going, I have no idea what I'm going to do, you know. <laughs> and I think maybe I was just overthinking it because actually, uh, uh, whatever happened, it, it was very organic and worked. So when I listened back to it, now I was like, "Hey, man, I did that." <laughs> yeah. Really? So there's a little bit of a country flavored song on that. Yeah, there's uh, uh there was a song Roger's uh, older brother, Colin which Colin used to play with Mungo Jerry. 
Cherry. Yeah, way back. What's that song? In the summertime or something like that? Yeah, yeah. Um, Daddy's rich. Da, 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 da. Yeah. Da, da, da. Yep, exactly. Well, Colin had wrote this song a long time ago, and it was kind of basically, you know, uh, like Hank Hank Williams coming to town, but he missed the show, which could have been there. Oh, is that um, why there's so much mention of him? Okay. Yeah, and that, that was the whole thing about it. It was like about, you know, so wanting to see Hank Williams, but missed it, you know. But uh, so he, he kind of got with Roger. He goes, you know, I've always, you know, wanted to do something with this. He goes, ah, I would like you guys to do something with this. So we said, okay, we'll do it. And I was actually pretty fun, you know. So what are you going to do, fire us? <laughs> it's our record. <laughs> well, the album is brand new. It comes out with like November 11th November 10th I believe it is yeah and, and uh any possibility of touring to promote it the we're always on tour well you mentioned <laughs> surgery and you know yeah uh, yeah that was that was last year I mean it was towards the end of the year uh it was like uh December is when we were December and January we were cramming in all the stuff and then he had surgery or now, he had a surgery in December, so we got him done in December, and then we followed through. But, you know, the way we travel anymore with fly dates, it's kind of like we're always available, you know. Uh, matter of fact, a uh, couple of month and a half, two months ago, it was like we knew we were going to New York on Saturday, but then we was like all of a sudden Linda calls me, and uh, – She's getting a hold of everybody. It's like, hey, look, you know, there's a uh, you know, blues traveler has to cancel because someone's ill. You know, are you available? You available? You available? So we all say, yeah, okay. And then she goes, okay, we're going to Anchorage, Alaska. <laughs> Be at the airport tomorrow morning. <laughs> so, but uh, you know, like this past week, you know, we played Thursday night just outside Boston at a fair festival, and then we played Friday night in Las Vegas. Wow. So. Yeah, so, but uh, we're starting to slow down right now. I mean, I think maybe we got 10 or 11 shows left for the year. Uh, but, you know, we, we run probably about 60-ish, sometimes 70 shows a year. So that's a lot of traveling. When are you coming through Michigan? Uh, we were just in Michigan. Where are you at in Michigan? In <laughs> mid now, I grew up in the Detroit area, but I'm Okay, in okay. Um, you probably played Pine Knob. Oh, yeah. Pine Knob's a great place. Um, I have to tell you, just go to foghat.com and click on the tour dates. Because here's the beauty about me being in Foghat. I don't look no more than a day ahead. Because <laughs> I don't have to do nothing but play bass. <laughs> That's the way yeah. uh -huh, uh -huh, you like it. That's right. Yeah, all my years with Pat Travers, I did everything. You know, I, I booked. I accountant merchandise travel agent website every now and then i got to play bass <laughs> so I to die without you. yeah so i just you know i did so much and uh it, when i first started coming and doing shows of fog hat i must have had this look on my face like i didn't know what to do and roger get up next to me he's like you don't quite know what to do with yourself do you i'm like I kind of don't. I feel like I should be doing something. He's like, just just hang out with me and play rock star. I'm like, okay, deal. <laughs> You've got a business background. You were in business with your dad, right? And you were big. Yeah, in yeah. I mean, I've done business stuff with my dad. I mean, all my I've always been that guy, you know, even in bands. I was the guy that, you know, booked the bands. I was the guy that, you know, put all the logistics together. Once upon a time, I was the guy that owned everything. You know, I had a semi on the road to haul all the gear, you know, back in the late 80s, early 90s, the big production rock clubs, you know. You just exude that aura of responsibility. Hey, I bet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but I've always been one of those ones, man. I, I'm always doing something. It's like even uh, all these years of uh, playing and touring, I still also... And that's kind of my joke with customers because I do window and door sales. So I'll meet with customers. At some point, something will jog it into a music direction. And then I'll finally go, well, actually, this is Clark Kent, Superman. <laughs> it's like a play bass for Foghat. And then people are like, no way. Sign me up. <laughs> but 
kind of gear are you playing? Tell me about your basses, strings, amps, effects, all that. Okay. Stuff. Crazy. I now I uh, when I was love Spectres, I got a couple of old Specter and S's. Love them. And I was started out playing my Specters when I was with Pat. But then we were getting ready to record a CD called Fidelis, and the producer, uh, Steve Thompson, he insisted he wanted a passive bass. So I got uh, a fretted Tony Franklin model Fender. So Yeah, so it's a P bass with a hopped up uh, jazz pickup in the rear. Does it have frets on it? Yeah, it's fretted. Tony Franklin bass with frets? Yep, yep. It's a fret. That was the fretted model. Uh, so yeah, back, back right over here, I got a fretless Tony Franklin hanging up there too. <laughs> that, but uh, and it's when you could have told me it had frets, I wouldn't have known the difference. I yeah, think. so I got a fretless one too. But uh, but now I got Tony Franklin was working uh, artist relations at Fender, and uh, he uh, he took care of me, and uh, so I started playing that for the recording with Pat, and I just kept playing it, and I was like, oh, I kind of dig this. And uh, after I got into Fog Hat, I got it was a custom build guy, uh, uh, Jimmy uh, Wilson, Landing Guitars uh, in Pittsburgh. His real claim to fame is is he builds a short scale bass that has sustain like a mofo because you know usually a short scale you you sacrifice sustain. And he actually builds one that looks exactly like a Stratocaster, but it's a bass. It's pretty cool. <laughs> but uh i got a um a bass from him that was kind of like a, a you know, jazz bass with a slight little twist to it and i played it for a long time and then what i've been playing the past year is a prs se just a simple seven eight hundred dollar bass i was in uh dave's guitars in milwaukee i think it is yeah and I was just, while everyone was like checking out guitars, I was looking at basses because they don't have many, but they had a couple of those. I go and Pat and uh, the other guitar player in Pat's band back in the day, they were playing the, the Paul Reed Smiths like crazy. And I started playing. I go, man, this thing sounds good. But what I really liked, it was neck through body, which reminded me of my Spectres. And uh, I was like, wow, this thing's got a nice punchy mid-range to it, and uh, it's just real solid. So I actually, because I hate spending money, I kept looking at it, and I was like, nah, nah, nah. But uh, the guitar tech that was with us, me and him, we grew up together, and he'd been, he was out with us for a little while. But I, I turned him on to you know sound gigs with Travers and different people, so... Uh, he decided to surprise me, so a week later he shows up at my house with it. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. <laughs> but I've been playing it ever since. I love it, and I, I've had a lot of uh, people that's been seeing me for years, and they see me with that one now, and they say, "Man, that bass suits you. It just kind of fits into your body and stuff." So it's they pretty cool. Good, and they look beautiful too. The yeah. It, it, what kind of freaked me out is uh, um, yeah, just recently, and and I as much as we travel, I, I don't have any issues where people go, oh, I lost my luggage, lost my luggage, whatever. But literally, they lost my guitar. Oh. And it, uh, what, about a week later, somebody calls me because I have my my name and number on the case. Well, well they had called the, they had called the, who it was tagged to, and the people's like going, we got our luggage. So then she looked at that. She called me. She goes, are you missing something? And I'm like, yes. So it actually got tagged wrong at the airport. And uh, uh, at that rate, there was no way to track it, right. you know, because it just went dead. You know, it went on a good plane to Atlanta and then it disappeared. So I was like going, God, I love that bass. But when I started looking, this one's all black. Well, all of a sudden now, they're only making it tobacco sunburst only. I'm like, what? So I'm actually getting a hold of people at PRS. It's like, no, I want a black one. <laughs> hey, who did I interview? Gary Granger plays PRS. Yes. Oh, my God. That's a, and, uh, that's a fantastic bass. Yeah. And I have uh, another site that uh, I haven't done with too much lately, but Al Demiola. 
I have a site called for guitar players only dot com. Okay. He had a title when I was in high school. And uh -huh. he he was very proud and he he loved his PRS bass because of the colors and everything on it. So yeah. What kind of strings do you play? I tell you what, I was never at a had a aha moment with strings until I got that fender from Tony. And he had actually slapped on his favorite set of strings, which are DR uh, Sunbeams. Okay. That's the first time I'd played. You know, to me, a string was just a string. You know, I just. Pretty colors? Huh? The, ones, the DRs with the pretty colors? No, 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 no. These aren't colored. I, no, no, I wouldn't do that. No, but, uh, but they're called Sunbeams. But. The only way I could describe them is they just kind of like, they got a buttery feel, you know, but that was the first string ever that just made me go, I get it. You know, as far as like an aha moment, other than that, it would be like, Hey, my strings are sounding really dead. Eh, what's available, you know? And, and I used Deodarius for years and, and my, eh, I loved them. I would say, but it was never, it was never a, but for some reason, I went to those and I, I instantly, I, I, I called Tony and I'm like going, what's on here? You know, what is this? And he told me and I was like, wow. Um, so uh, every now and then, if we can't get a hold of them, I know real quick. Ah, this ain't my regular string. <laughs> what about amps and effects? You know, the way we travel, you know, we're kind of at the mercy of backline companies. So um, I go with the old standard, you know, I, I now the all tube classics for some reason just don't work for me. It, it's weird. I mean, I can I can hand the bass to somebody else and they play it and go, God, that sounds great. And I grab the bass and start to play. It always just sounds mushy. Uh, now, what I like is the Ampeg 4 Pro which is a hybrid. You know, it's a tube preamp, but it's got that MOSFET power. Uh, that stays clean and punchy to me. That works for me. Um, so I ask for that a lot. And of course, the standard 810 cabinet. I would prefer double 15s. I love the sound of 15s. But, you know, I don't want a bunch of single 15 cabinets everywhere. So I was like, yeah, I'll just stick with the 810. <laughs> Yeah, but, uh, you know, so I do that, and then in a pinch, if they, you know, I can't get the Ampeg, I use the uh, GK1001, but, you know, a lot of my sound, though, I still use my Sans Amp, been using my Sans Amp for years, uh, okay. yep, yep, so, uh, you know, between my Sans Amp and I got an MXR compressor, and believe it or not, my wireless, I get a certain amount of just uh character out of my wireless so if all of a sudden if you have an issue with a wireless and you got to go to a cable it's like no oh, my sound just changed <laughs> here you let's talk about playing bass and learning bass for bass players only is a bass instruction site i have seen your site yes sir thank you i have every uh, now and then i try to go you know i want to learn something <laughs> I'll keep learning. But most of the people that I'm attracting are mostly men. I'm, I'm getting actually more women signing up now, too. But uh, people generally in their 50s, 60s, 70s. I had a guy sign up the other day who's 83 years old. Wow. Well, they're not trying to be, you know, rock stars. They're not career bound. They just maybe they have some time now. Just have fun. Yeah. Fun. They want to play some classic rock riffs with their buddies or some blues shuffles or some fog hat classics or something That's like it. that. Slow ride. Go. <laughs> when you get into your 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, you know, sometimes things like arthritis and tendonitis and shoulder surgery and things like yeah. that. Yeah. Well, it's not like you know, I'm, I'm, I hope I'm not painting a dire picture here. I'm just trying to give you a general context because I want I want you to know who I'm attracting. And I'm getting, uh, you know, from pretty much all 50 states right now and about 50, 60 some countries around the world, people coming to for bass players only every day to learn bass. So in that context, what advice can you impart to somebody like that who wants to learn how to play bass? What do you think they should be thinking about? 
I was self-taught, you know, everything was like to me just trying to dial in my ear and figure out what's going on. Of course, that's my joke with Craig, you know, when we first met, I was like, dude, you have no idea how bad I messed up, you know, my fog hat live record, constantly picking the needle up and dropping it and dropping it, trying to figure out what you're doing. Um, but man, training your ear, you know, learning, learning to kind of, uh, you know, to, to decipher pick picking out parts, but then also another thing is is like if you're trying to get into playing songs, because that's the thing, that's the real victory when you're actually playing songs. You could you know do scales all day or or this exercise or that exercise, but the main thing is is you know you want to crank up your speakers and you want to play along with something. You know, is kind of trying to learn a lot of the formulas because you know. It's not like a, a lot of things like reinvent, reinventing the wheel, but I mean, you know, it's like uh, once you start to hear certain passages, you'll you'll know that, hey, you know, hey, they just kicked the song on the four, you know, then you'll learn that, okay, now I'm going to go to the one. In layman's terms, say the song is in G, okay, all of a sudden they kick it on the C, and then they'll go back to G, and that's where the one is. And uh, you start finding your direction around there, Uh and that 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 helps you create a roadmap real quick to getting the basic framework to songs. And then from there, you start connecting the dots with the different, you know, walking lines and and passing tones and stuff. But, you know, for for what you're saying, like a lot of people that are attracted to your site, you know, that that's kind of what I, they're probably looking for. I want to learn how to play, but I want to try to get into playing with some songs as quick as I can so I can feel like i'm in the band man <laughs> you know what's funny it surprised me a bit at first but a lot of people are not really that interested in playing in a band with other people they're perfectly content to sit at home alone in a room and just practice the bass i think that's probably yeah. less yeah and just you play along with play along with cds or records or whatever yeah hey having a band together is like one of the hardest things in the world <laughs> It's gotten easier later in life. When I was younger, it was like hard to keep a band together. It seemed like, you know, every time you turned around, somebody was quitting or you were firing somebody or whatever. Um, you know, I played with Pat close to nine years. Out of those nine years, there was five of them that there was just the solid four of us. There was Pat, Kurt and Kim on guitar, Sandy Gennaro on drums, and I was on bass. So, that was probably the longest period Pat ever had a consistent man in his career, <laughs> you know, five years, no member changes at all, you know, because I mean, like the heyday, the Pat Travers band uh, with Mars Cowling and Tommy Aldridge and Pat Thrall, that only lasted like two, two and a half years. I yeah, was very of Aerosmith. Have they ever had a single personnel change? Yeah, they did. There was uh, there was. There was a point in the 80s when uh, Joe Perry and uh, Brad Whitford were both out of the band. Um, yeah, that that I saw one of those tours. It wasn't pretty. <laughs> but uh, but when they came back, boy, they came back strong. So, what about the future? What else? You've done a lot. Anything that maybe you've always wanted to do but haven't gotten around to yet, or someday I'm gonna. What's what's in store for you in the future, Rodney? I don't know. You know, I mean, like my thing is is not only do I love playing bass, but I love being an entertainer. You know, um, so I, I definitely I'm not that quiet bass player on stage. You know, I kind of make my way around, and uh, uh, so I enjoy enter entertaining people and interacting. Um, I don't know. You know, my whole thing is, is the way I view it is I'm definitely, as long as Roger wants to play, I'm right there. You know, so I don't plan on going anywhere, you know. And according to Roger, he he's telling us he's got another 20 years. <laughs> well, look, you know, look, look at Paul Simon, Paul McCartney, Bob Dylan. Uh, I mean, Buddy Guy right now is 86, 87. Who is? Buddy Guy. I saw him on his 80th birthday. Yeah, well, he's 86 or 87 now, and he's still running up and down the aisles of the theaters and everything. 
Somebody just turned 80 like a day or two ago, and I can't remember who it was, but it was somebody in that in that mix. I don't know. Yeah. What would you be if you were not a bass player? Something outside of music. I'd be a window salesman. <laughs> well, you are a window. I've actually I've actually been in the window and door business for 24 years. So you're, you're still uh still doing it now? Huh? Still doing it now? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I've I've got like the dream um, combination things. I, I've got a company that I've been working with all these years. The, you know, their joke is is they want to live vicariously through me, me telling them about all my cool travels, and then they want me to stay working there so I'll stay humble. <laughs> But, uh, you know, with the way uh, the, the world we live in now, I mean, I, I, I do, I meet with people all the time and then I'll go get on the airplane between airports and hotels I'm on my laptop and I'm doing business, you know. Uh, so I, I stay very busy with it and, you know, I'm, I guess I'm good at it. I got a, the gift of gab or something, you know, because uh, all the years I've been in the, the, the business, you know, I'm kind of a, a big, I'm a big deal in the window and door business. There you go. <laughs> well, I, but I've been very blessed to find a balance like that because that's almost like the unheard of thing. Well, you can have two careers at the same time and either one gets mad with about the other, you know? So every now and then it will fog out. It's like, okay, I got to watch my schedule. I got these meetings, this, that, the other. And it's like, okay. So, so everybody plays nice together. <laughs> I've interviewed over 800 bass players, and you're the first one that's ever also been a window salesman. Yeah, I, I wouldn't recommend it to anybody. <laughs> In your blood. Yeah, well, yeah, something like that. <laughs> well, thanks for hanging with me today. I really enjoyed it. Absolute, absolute pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Forward to meeting you in person and seeing you. Yeah. Well, Come on down. Calm down. Oh. That's it. Tell them where he went, Bob. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you, Rodney. You're watching for BassPlayersOnly.com. I'm John Liebman, founder and first baseman. A lot of people think they're too old or it's too late for them to learn how to play an instrument. So I created for BassPlayersOnly.com for adults who want to learn to play bass because I believe you're never too old and it's never too late to experience the joy and the pleasure of making music. For BassPlayersOnly.com, this is the place to learn bass. Thanks again to my special guest, Rodney O'Quinn. I will see you all next week right here, same time, same place, for BassPlayersOnly.com. In the meantime, let's play bass.